do a lot of the guidebook and some of you may have had the chance to see the guidebook and some of you um, this may be the first time seeing it and so this will serve as an opportunity for you to uh, review it and, and ask any questions that you may have and we'll allow ample time at the end for kind of just a general q a so as questions pop up please feel free to enter them in the chat box so we can address them um, this is our, our first year with the program and so there may be some questions that come up that are more thought provoking and great consideration for our committee uh, we've done our best to lay out what we feel is a well thought out program, um, but yet we also recognize there's going to be opportunity for us to grow as well. And so any suggestions you may have, we will take them uh, wholeheartedly and, and make sure that we're continuing to always progress and move forward. Uh, so I will kind of do a little introduction of our guidebook. So you'll have the the cover page and then a table of contents that shows you where and what pages you can locate all the resources. And then those that have been working to put this program together, I'll allow each of my committee members to introduce themselves. But I'm Amber Erickson. I'm the 4-H Field Operations Coordinator based out of the State 4-H office. Uh, and I'll let Caroline introduce herself. Hey everyone, I'm Caroline Hansen. I'm the 4-H Youth Program Advisor in Davison and Hanson County. So I'm in Mitchell and Alexandria. Hi all, my name is Hilary Reisner and I'm a Regional 4-H Youth Program Advisor. I'm based at the West River Research and Extension Center in Rapid City. Uh, of seven counties along with some um, state appointment. And then our other committee member is, is providing the closed captioning for us this evening. So I'll go ahead and introduce her. It's Janae Hansen. She is our 4-H volunteer development field specialist and she is based out of the Aberdeen Regional Center. So uh, if you do not um, have access to the guidebook currently through Box, which you can create a, a free account to gain access to that folder. Uh, another way you can access the guidebook is to email your 4-H professional uh, in your county and, and they have access to it as well and can certainly send it to you or you can reach out to any one of the committee members and we would be happy to provide it to you then. Uh, so there's kind of three different avenues that you can get access to the guidebook. Uh, so this program was really developed as we recognize the uh, opportunity to take an in-depth approach to civic engagement and, and also providing a platform for youth to share their voice. And so modeled um, after our, our state's government uh, process, we have developed the South Dakota 4-H Legislature where teams across uh, the state of South Dakota will have the opportunity to run for uh, a House of Representatives seat in, in our 4-H Legislature. Uh, and those, I'll get into roles and responsibilities, uh, but we'll also have the component where 4-H members can also serve as a constituent, so a citizen voter and, and engage in the process and provide feedback to their elected officials for their counties. Uh, so really it's geared to provide that leadership experience, that mentorship experience, engage in public speaking and critical thinking, uh, again providing that youth voice component uh, and, and maybe some of the bills that are created through this process will then be implemented uh, as changes that we see in the 4-H program. So there's really a, a neat opportunity for, for youth of all ages to engage in this program. You want to go on to the next. So as I alluded to, there's, there's kind of different roles and responsibilities. That first role being candidates or, or legislatures. So we um, will we'll utilize the House of Representatives to um, 
have the different elected officials and there's 70 seats within the House of Representatives and that uh, will equate to one representative for each county and then there will be at large uh, representatives that will be selected as well because if you think about it we have 66 counties in the state of South Dakota um, and there are 70. If for some reason there isn't a representative that runs from a particular county, that'll kind of fluctuate our at-large positions. But each county will have the opportunity to have one elected official for their county. Um, and we're asking those that run be the ages of 14 to 18. Uh, so our senior age 4-H members. And they'll engage in the process from declaring their candidacy to collecting uh, signatures for their petition, um, conducting a campaign, so developing some different uh, materials to advocate for themselves. And then we will host an online election. And, um, and then those that are, are selected will start to develop bills that are 4-H are related and then eventually move into a, a mock session that we'll have on the actual house floor of our state's capital. Um, while my colleagues will kind of go more in depth into those different components, uh, this is a really unique opportunity for that, that teen voice. The other side of it is the constituents. So if you think about uh, our responsibility as a South Dakota uh, citizen is to engage in our governmental process from the voting aspect, um, signing or, or signing different candidates petitions, uh, being able to voice our opinions and, and, and advocate for certain policies we want to see or, or changes we want made. And so we're allowing that opportunity through this process um, for our constituents or other any other 4-H members to engage. So as Amber said, we kind of have um, roles and responsibilities for both um, those that are interested in running for a representative position as well as those who would like to just be a constituent and observe the process and learn along with us. So this this page that we have up now is kind of our checklist um, to help keep you on track and to give you a one place to go kind of to see all the the requirements in order to be a representative or um, the opportunities we have for those constituents as well. So you can see in the first section we have prior to the election, um, this first webinar, which we are on right now, um, and then your intent to run, um, your petition signatures, and then your campaign materials are all listed. So the intent of this is kind of a, as you do it, you check it off, you know it's done, have the deadline there. And as long as you have all of these things completed, um, you know you're on task to carry on with the process. Um, so then at the bottom there we have just kind of a reminder of our code of conduct that every 4-H member signs and agrees to um, when they re-enroll for the year. We just wanted to remind you all um, that we are expecting a positive experience, a positive environment. Um, we understand that not everybody will agree maybe with your your stance on some of these issues and you know just like they do in the state legislature they disagree at times but they still have to be respectful and um, remember that they're representing not only themselves but they're representing South Dakota 4-H and their constituents throughout the process and so we just want to to make sure that everyone has a positive experience when they whether they're um, observing or whether they're um, actively participating as a representative in the process. So um, this is page six, I believe, of the guidebook. And then the reminder of your full code of conduct is one of the um, appendix pages in the back. And then the dress code, we just ask you to dress professionally 
um, for the event, we will provide a polo and a name tag if you are elected. If you are not, just a business casual, um, just to look nice. Again, we're representing 4-H, we're representing our program, and we just want to make sure that we are dressing professionally when we're interacting with other individuals. So then we'll jump into kind of the timeline and how the process is gonna look. Um, so at the very top there, you can kind of see our, our timeline from today to the actual event being held on October 3rd. Um, there's some more details as we get into other pages, but I'll briefly touch on some of them. You'll see a lot of them are webinars. And so the reason we've kind of chosen to do webinars is, um, I'm sure you've all noticed everything has gone virtual. And so we wanna make sure that we provide an opportunity for everybody to be able to participate. And even if you are not an elected representative from your county, you're still welcome to hop on to any of those webinars to learn more about the process. We want this to be a very educational experience for everyone. And so we have welcomed anybody to, to jump on and learn about bill writing or committee meetings or things like that. And then at the bottom there, um, you can see kind of the duration of the event um, and then the location, which as we stated, or as Amber stated, will be on the house floor, which is really cool. We'll get to debate those bills right on the, the same, um, in the same seats that our state legislators use. And then the cost is, is very minimal. So the only cost we are anticipating is your cost of travel to get to pier on October 3rd. And then we provided a little bit more description of what we're hoping you get out of these webinars. So you'll see like the one on May 1st is our campaign process. So we will be covering both what a what a, a real world, I guess you could say, um, campaign looks like, as well as what that's gonna look like for our program. Um, it's obviously gonna be slightly different, but we wanna make sure that we provide the opportunity for you to learn about both processes and how those are similar, but also how they're gonna look different. And then the June 8th webinar I wanna point out is our voting process. So that's a really important one for everybody to attend because that's gonna, we're gonna go over how you vote and what that voting looks like. And then on June 15th through 19th is when our voting opens. So that's when you get to log in and actually cast your vote for your representative that you would like to represent your county. So it's a very exciting time. And then as I stated earlier, the other webinars are open for anybody. Um, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time just reading these pages for you, um, but I just wanted to point out those couple events so that you were aware um, of kind of the, the big project timelines. Um, and again, it's gonna be, every one of those is both comparing the real world and to how our mock legislative session is going to look. And we're not expecting our 4-H kids to become experts in this by any means. And so what we're doing with the webinars is we're kind of bringing the experts to you. So we'll have hopefully some guest speakers in those webinars to talk about their experiences, people who've worked in those fields, people who are active in those fields now to provide you with that experience and that firsthand look at what those job descriptions look like. And then again, we just have um, the layout of those objectives with all the links provided already. So you'll go to each one of those links at the time of the webinar. If you're not available at that time, um, please don't let that be discouragement for you to participate. We will be providing those recordings um, afterwards. Um, but we would encourage you to log on live because then you can ask your questions and be involved in the interactive discussions that we do have. 
And then I believe Hillary is going to jump on with the campaign trail. Yeah, so um, the, the next part is kind of uh, going to be a, a large chunk of the process itself, and that's that campaign trail. Uh, so we just we really wanted to kind of outline um, what that's going to look like so you have an understanding of what to expect. And so um, the first step in any uh, individual's um, campaign trail is to officially declare their candidacy. And um, so, you know, again, I won't necessarily walk you through that process exactly as it's, it's outlined um, in the guidebook, but we are doing um, ours a little different, obviously. Um, but your official declaration of candidacy would be to simply fill out um, a question pro form and it just gives us um, your basic information and officially makes that declaration that you um, wish to to serve as a candidate and that you want your name included um, on um, the, the petition to, ha to have a petition um, circulated on behalf of you. And so in order to access that, um, that's actually this link. Um, if you can see my mouse hovering over, it's called a bit.ly, it's, so it's shortened, um, but you would just click on that and then that would take you to the question pro that allows you to officially declare your candidacy. So that does have to be done by May 15th and that is outlined a couple times throughout all of those different timelines that we've provided. Um, so the next uh, big thing that I wanted to touch on is the document sharing platform. I know we had a couple questions about um, accessing Box and um, we, we do recognize that um, this will be a learning curve for everyone. Um, but just with this program, we are hoping that, um, that we can um, utilize Box and start to become familiar with that. So it's, it is our document sharing platform. Um, and so within the guidebook, um, there, there is actually a help sheet on how to um, utilize Box and, and different um, maybe action items that you might have in um, the process of, of this program. Um, but we will be using um, a particular folder that will house everything that has to do with um, the South Dakota 40 later program, specific to the 2020 year. Um, and so that is um, right here, it's hyperlinked in the guidebook and you would just click on that. Um, I am gonna move to the, the Utilizing Box help sheet. So um, for that initial access of Box, you will have to create uh, a free um, uh, Box account. And so um, you will notice in this um, particular screenshot here, I'll zoom in, um, it, it does say um, that you, you just enter like your first name, um, an email address, and then a password um, and an optional phone number, and then you click submit. And then that will provide you a so-called free account um, to box. And you'll just wanna make sure, just like with every other account you have, you remember um, the email address that you associated with that account, and then obviously the password that you um, provided for that account. Um, so if you're using the link to access um, the, the guidebook, um, it'll bring you to a, to a screen and just underneath, um, it'll, you'll need to click on a, um, a hyperlink that says like you don't have um, a box account. And then this, this window will pop up for you to create that free account. Um, so that is one thing to access that guidebook um, from box. Otherwise, um, after you have declared your candidacy, that will prompt us to um, actually send you um, an email so that um, you will then have access to the box folder. Um, and so you'll accept the invite as it says here. Um, if you've already created the box folder or box account, you won't necessarily have to do that. Um, but then you'll have access to this box folder. And eventually, as we have all of our candidates, each candidate um, will have their own individual's folder. And so that, that folder will um, look similar to this with your county name and then um, for last name followed by first name. So I just kind of wanted to provide that, um, address that, that you will have to create a free account um, for Box in order to access um, that guidebook. But um, if you have access to the guidebook now, um, the process will look a little bit different as you um, are declaring your candidacy and you get that email that we've invited you um, to the folder. Um, 
So then um, circulating a petition. So once you have declared your candidacy, um, it will um, prompt us to then create a um, folder, as I indicated for you, on a subfolder on the, the box folder. Um, and then this is where you will develop some of your um, campaign material um, and you will start circulating um, your petition. And so um, each of you will have a, an individual URL that um, you can circulate to constituents uh, to circulate a petition. And so a petition is essentially just getting the buy-in of your constituents saying that, yeah, I, I think this individual would serve our county well, um, and I would like to see them um, on, on the ballot. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's not a terribly official process and it's not a voting process. So it's just that initial stage of individuals giving you the go-ahead that, um, you know, they would like to see your name potentially on the ballot and to see you continue campaigning to represent their county. Um, and so that'll be done again via Question Pro. Um, you'll just simply circulate that unique URL for your petition um, to individuals in your county and they will so-called sign the petition um, via Question Pro and um, you will have to get a certain number of um, signatures and so in order to determine that um, you will refer to your petition matrix that is in the appendix of the guidebook and I will go to that just briefly so I can talk through that. Um, so this is what the petition matrix looks like. Obviously it's a, um, an image of South Dakota and it's broken down by all of the different counties. And um, so the way that you determine how many signatures you need is you actually would find your county. Um, so for instance, if I'm from Corson County, I would find uh, Corson County and I would see how many 4-H members were enrolled in my county based on the 2018-19 4 h year. So Corson County had 64 members. And so once you figured out how many members you had in the previous 4 h year, then you would go down to this little table and you would find um, the, the line in which your county lies. So um, between one and 49 members, 50 and 99 and so on. So Corson County would obviously um, fall within this, this second line here between 50 and 99 members. So I would need to get 10 signatures on my petition in order to um, be able to continue my campaign and then eventually have my name included on the ballot. Um, so hopefully that's clear enough. Um, we tried to make it so that those counties with uh, a bit larger 4-H membership um, do you have to receive quite a bit uh, more signatures on their petition? And then um, on the flip side, those that have a, a smaller county aren't needing as many signatures. Um, certainly you can let us know if you have questions on this process, but hopefully it's pretty straightforward just finding your county and then finding um, kind of what group your county lies within to know how many signatures you ultimately need. Okay. So then um, that kind of takes us through the circulating the petition process. Um, next on the campaign trail is creating uh, those campaign uh, documents. And so um, I don't know if your parents are registered to vote, but I know when I registered to vote, um, I rece started receiving all sorts of what they call rack cards. And so um, they're just kind of laminated little hash of paper that um, summarize the information of that candidate and provide you information that you might need to know in order to make an informed decision on that candidate so that you know if, if they're going to represent you correctly. And so um, you will have the opportunity to do the same thing um, by creating a, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be the same dimensions as a rat card, but even just a one pager document um, that just briefly explains how you could best serve um, your county. So again, my example of Corson County, how could I best serve Corson County um, on the South Dakota 4-H legislator? What are the things that I'm going to be passionate about for my fellow 4-H members or constituents? And so the appendix um, does include 
um, a, a sample of that. And then also it gives um, kind of some guidance on things to include. Certainly this isn't a, um, a all inclusive list. You can include other items on your one pager uh, rack card. Um, but this is just a starting point of things to consider when you're developing this, this document. Um, and so this is kind of our example of what mon one might look like. Um, obviously here where there's a silhouette image, you're welcome to include, include a photo of yourself. You know, a lot of the rack cards that I've received in the actual mail, um, they have photos of themselves. So you get to see what they look like and associate them with that. Um, so then once the rack card has been developed, we'll go through this in um, the campaigning process webinar next week. But all of the campaigning material will then be uploaded to um, the box folder so that it can be accessed by um, individuals looking to see who it all is running from their county um, and then they can make an informed decision on um, those individuals. You can also um, uh, circulate your campaign material um, in your counties. You might want to make contact with your county uh, program advisor or program assistant or secretary to ha have them help you um, send out that information to your 4-H membership. Um, and then also putting it out on social media if you have a, a good following of, of potential 4-H members on your social media accounts of um, getting them to see that you're, you're campaigning. The next thing would be developing a campaign video. Um, and so uh, this will be you know, utilized again as a tool to get the word out that you are um, running for uh, South Dakota 4 H legislature. And um, it's just a, a very short sound bite, 30 seconds to one minute in length. It doesn't have to be very long, but um, really sell yourself and, and explain again why you think you would be the best candidate for um, your county in the South Dakota 4 H legislature. Um, again, we have provided some guidance on that. So in the appendix of the guidebook, there's a creating a campaigning video um, a document, and it just talks you through. Kind of some different steps of creating that video, um, some, some guiding points, and then also um, uploading your, your file um, or your, um, your video to the box folder. Additionally with that, um, there are several pages you will notice. Um, I'm not going to scan through all of these, but it's a document called 4-H Filmmaking, and it walks and walk you through the process of um, actually putting together a video and, and filmmaking, and it provides some more in-depth um, explanation and, and guidance on how to actually um, develop a video. So you can certainly use that as guidance. You're also welcome to use any other sort of um, curriculum or resources that you find online to putting that video together. So then once you um, have all of those documents um, put together, again, those will be located on Box, um, and you can have those circulated in your county, reaching out to your county 4-H offices to circulate them. And then um, it's the role of the constituent or the voters um, to get to know their candidates. And so that's the time for them to view those documents, to maybe have conversations with those individuals about things that they're interested in or, or um, you know, um, ideas that they have to represent their county and, and beyond the South Dakota legislature. And it's really that time to um, do that campaigning process and then the, the constituents getting to know their candidates so that they can make an informed um, decision when voting. So as I said, this doc one document's kind of long, um, but it's a, a decent resource for that. So then that brings us to the actual election process. Um, and so this process, uh, again, we recognize this doesn't mimic exactly the South Dakota uh, legislature process, um, but again, with the you know, constraints of um, COVID-19, and then also just knowing um, you know, capacity of, of making it happen um, exactly the way that they do um, from a, a state perspective um, just wasn't feasible for us this year. So it looks a little different, um, but once a candidate um, has received a number of signatures on their petition, then um, they'll be included on a ballot, which we will facilitate again through the question pro process. Um, and so, um, 
then their constituents can go on to that question pro and vote for um, the candidate they would like to represent them um, in the South Dakota 4-H legislature. In some cases, there might only be one candidate and that's okay. Um, in other cases, there might be several and um, those constituents will really have to make a decision on um, who they, they feel is gonna best serve them at the Capitol. Um, and so then it also talks through Voters, um, again, voting opens June 15th to the 19th, um, and there's that direct link to the um, ballot. And then election results will be announced July 1st, and we will announce those on multiple platforms um, so that not only you as a, a potential um, candidate, and then um, if you win the election, a, a legislature will know, um, but also so the constituents are aware of who will be representing their county. So I think I'm going to pass it off to I am sincerely apologetic. I don't know how long I cut out there. Our internet has been ridiculous. Um, so I'm sorry, I, it just threw me off. So I hope you can see the screen now. Um, can somebody confirm that? Okay, all right, perfect. Um, okay, so I um, Amber is gonna go ahead and discuss the legislative process. Amber, I think your mic is muted. Um, this is Ron Frederick. I still can't hear Amber. I think yeah. she's still muted. I can't either. Um, I think she's still muted, it looks like. Yeah. <laughs> so um, for the sake of time, I will just go ahead and talk through the legislative process and then hopefully Amber will get her um, mic figured out. Um, so then moving into the legislative process. So as you see, we actually have um, two roles that individuals will play within the process um, and so the big one is obviously the 4-H legislatures 
Um, and so they will have opportunities to actually draft legislation, which we also know as bills. Um, and then they will have opportunities to um, debate those bills on the actual House um, floor um, and then um, put those bills into so-called action. And as Amber mentioned earlier, um, there is a potential for some of those bills to be considered um, if it's a county level bill um, at the county level, we will pass those on for consideration. Um, but then also at the state level, if there's bills that are passed that would affect um, say a, a state rule or policy or something like that, um, we'll pass that on for consideration. So that's really where that youth voice comes into play. Uh, and then there's obviously listening to constituent input and um, taking into consideration the things that your constituents are passionate about and would like to be done with the, um, the South Dakota 4-H program. And then um, preparing for session. Um, so just um, making sure that you're prepared to debate bills and um, to um, have those caucus meetings or, or the committee meetings. Um, and just really getting ready for that actual event or session um, as our legislatures would know, know it as. Then on the other side is our 4-H constituents, which plays a really huge part in um, making sure that legislation is drafted that truly affects um, their county and, and the program as a whole. And so they will work to advocate and what we may know as lobby um, our legislatures and, and um, helping them understand subject areas that they're passionate about or that needs um, addressing. And so they will have those communications with those legislators. And then they also have the opportunity to observe the process. Um, so just like if anybody attended the South Dakota 4-H Capital Day in um, January, we were able to observe uh, the legislative process. You will also, as constituents, have that opportunity to come to peer uh, and watch the South Dakota 4-H legislative process. Um, so you know, getting to observe that whole process there. So then um, you'll find in the appendix, we um, kind of get provided some resources of walking you through drafting a bill. Um, and so this is what that drafting a bill document looks like. And, and as a legislature, um, some things to consider when drafting those bills. Obviously these will, will go into much further conver conversation um, when we have these specific webinars, um, but these are provided so you have a, an idea of what um, your, your bill expectations will be. Um, and we will note that our bills will primarily be 4-H focused as we've talked. Um, Amber, can you don't in talking? Um, looks like Hillary cut out again. Yeah, so I, I kind of caught what, what Hillary um, was ending on. So our, our bills will be primarily 4-H focused uh, so, and our uh, elected officials will have the opportunity to, to draft those bills on whatever topics related to 4-H and, and that really correlates nicely to that, that youth voice component and utilizing um, the impact of what bills are, are made and passed within our South Dakota 4-H legislature um, to be have the opportunity to possibly direct change for our South Dakota 4-H organization. Um, and so once those bills are, are drafted, uh, so if you think about it from the two, two different role components, uh, we have our elected officials and then we have our constituents. And those constituents will be able to see the bills that our elected officials have, have drafted and be able to weigh in their opinion. And, and that's kind of a role as a, a legislator as well is to uh, 
be willing to listen to your membership, be willing to take input, and, and you're really serving as that voice for your, for your membership. Uh, and so then once all of the bills are drafted, we will, it kind of comes to the mock legislative session event. And there we will break into different committee work and, and kind of dissect those different bills. And, and um, from committee work, we'll move into caucuses. And then uh, in the afternoon, we will have the actual debating of the bills and passing or failing uh, the created bills of that are 4-H legislators created. So then um, we just kind of work our way through the document into we have developed some frequently asked questions or, or predicted frequently asked questions and um, so one of the big things you're probably asking yourself is, is there a cost to this program? And as we kind of stated earlier, we want this to be as cost minimal as we can. Uh, so really the anticipated cost is if you're a selected uh, representative for your county, then it would be the cost of, of traveling to the Capitol uh, for our mock session. Um, other than that, you're engaging through different webinars and, and uh, promoting yourself locally, uh, but we, we want this to be as cost reduced as possible. If you are a constituent and you, you want to come and view the, the mock session, we, we certainly invite you to. We think this is a great learning opportunity and also to see your peers out on the floor um, discussing the different bills and as you follow them through the process. Uh, otherwise, it is not required as a constituent and so don't feel you, you have to, but we certainly encourage you to. Um, we recognize that you may have conflicts already on some of our scheduled webinar dates. And so you're certainly still able to participate if you are one of um, the candidates running for a uh, 4-H representative or you were selected as one of the 4-H representatives, we do expect that you watch the recording uh, and there'll be a short, not really in depth, but worksheet to kind of showcase that you did participate in that recording. Uh, so our South Dakota 4-H representatives are geared towards our senior age members, 14 to 18. So uh, if you are 13 years old, uh, we encourage you to participate and, and engage as much as possible and kind of see uh, what it's all about so you're ready to go that, that following year. Uh, but we are going to follow 4-H age and that'll be 14 to 18 as of the current 4-H year. Um, is there a dress code for the program? Webinars, we, we don't, we don't expect you to get all dressed up. You can certainly just have casual wear for those webinars, but we do ask it to be appropriate. Uh, and again, as stated earlier, for that actual mock session day, we ask that you, um, if you're coming to view as a constituent, be in kind of business casual dress. Uh, and then as a elected official, you, will be provided a polo and a name tag and then um, probably black or khaki bottoms would be the, the dress code. And then um, we encourage not only other 4-H members that to come and partake in that event, uh, but also if you're a family member and, and want to see kind of the action throughout the day, uh, you're certainly welcome to participate. So now I think Caroline's going to walk us through um, concepts and, and procedures. Yeah, so at the end of our booklet here, we've got some documents kind of laying out um, the actual South Dakota legislative process and kind of what that looks like. So this first page here are just some facts and figures about our state government or your state government. Um, and then you can see that there are two bodies. We have a Senate and a House of Representatives. We have 105 legislators total. 
and that our state um, constitution limit, limits our legislative session to 40 days. Um, and that's important because you'll note as you look through the legislative terms, um, one of the options to, or excuse me, the official business, one of the options you can do is defer a bill to the 41st day. And what that means is, is essentially you're killing the bill because there is no 41st day. Um, so that's a way that a attorney will hear often in the South Dakota legislature during session. Um, so again, I'm, I'm not gonna go through it line by line, but just for your reference, just so you know, um, kind of our actual legislature and how that's made up. Um, on the next page there is our caucus, which Amber briefly talked about. Um, the caucuses are typically members meeting within their political party. Um, we're not going to be obviously asking you to declare a party that will be a split up as at, a, at random for our program. Um, but these are times right before session where all the legislators get together and talk about the bills that were discussed in different committees um, because not all legislators sit on every single committee and so then they, they this gives them an opportunity to bring back um, some information that they heard during that committee meeting um, to their fellow um, legislators before they take a vote on the floor. So those committees are one thing we, that we, we will do. Um, so the unique part about committees is that every single bill has to be heard and every single bill will hear public testimony. Um, and we are going to try our best to keep that as close as we can. Um, so for your bills, we will hopefully be finding some volunteers to come in and give us the pros and the cons of, of why that's a good bill or why maybe it's not. And then you, um, our, our elected representatives will get the opportunity to decide whether they want to see that bill debated on the floor or as a whole. And so then we've also included some um, common phrases and terms and things that are done when conducting official business. We will go much more in depth into these when we look at our committee caucus webinar as well as our house floor webinar right before the event. Um, but we just wanted to make sure you had some examples to look through. So for example, the first one is the main motion. This is anything, anytime you wanna pass a bill or things like that, you'll have to have a main motion. Um, and we included kind of what those look like. Um, sometimes this, the legislative procedure is slightly different than what we know of um, the Roberts Rules of Order um, parliamentary procedure, but they're very similar. And then as we move on, the last couple pages are just some legislative terms. So those are, again, just for your reference, we don't need to, I don't feel like we need to go through every single one um, as we sit here. I wanna make sure we give you guys ample time for questions. So um, with that, I will just end it with, like we said, um, we're not expecting you to be experts. Um, I know we just went through a lot of information um, and it may be a bit overwhelming, but please know that we as a planning committee intend to be there for every single step of the way. And we intend to help you out with every single step of the process. This is a learning opportunity. We, even the day of the event, we don't expect you to know everything. Um, and we will be there to help you with that. So please don't be overwhelmed by the amount of information in the guidebook. A lot of it is just reference for you so that you are able to participate and have the information in front of you. Um, I believe Ron had a question about the Legislative Research Council conducting bills. Um, he is correct. The, typically the Legislative Research Council does help draft those bills. It's not all just the legislators. So for our example in our mock session, we as a planning committee are sort of serving as that legislative research council. So we'll have our, um, our legislators come up with the ideas um, and we will help them draft bills. We want them to learn 
kind of what that looks like and some of the terminology for that. Um, but we will definitely be helping them. If, for example, if you'll look on the, uh, if you look on the, can you still hear me? Okay, if you look on the timeline, you'll see that we have um, a preliminary date for bills to be due and then the final draft isn't due for another month. So we, um, we definitely intend to help them with that process. Ron, did that answer your question? Awesome. And then with we that, have, if anybody else has We have another question, question come in um, regarding, uh, the question states, is signing of the candidate's petition only available to members from the persons for each county or can anyone from the state sign it? And so if you think about actual um, legislative process, though you're, you're getting the buy-in from your district. And so signing the petition will be for the, your 4-H members of your county. Great question though. And then um, we had a question regarding where the rope recordings will be located and they will be located on box um, thank you alex for providing that link uh, we will make them available to be watched in case you missed parts of it or you have individuals that have reached out to you saying that they just weren't able to make it on tonight great questions i will apologize when my computer crashed um, it erased some of the questions. So if I'm not seeing a question that came in, please type it in again. Uh, I see we have a question regarding all ages to sign petition. Yes, if you're a 4-H age, um, any age member, 4-H age member can sign a petition. Great question. Any other questions? Um, Cheryl has a question about if just 4-H members can sign or if leaders can sign. Um, it will just be open to 4-H members to sign those petitions. Yeah, and we encourage as leaders or volunteers, mentors, uh, we encourage you to assist candidates in, in promoting their materials, getting it out to your membership, uh, letting individuals know that in your, your county that they're running and assisting that way and kind of serving as a, a mentor. Uh, but um, yeah, it'll be limited to 4-H members as Caroline stated. But leaders are also welcome to join us on the webinars if they'd like to learn more about the process. Again, we're going to be talking about the real world legislature as well as our 4-H legislature. So you are more than welcome to hop on as parents, leaders, and then all age members. Any other additional questions we can help clarify? Well, if not, you can always reach out to us. Um, it, I, our email addresses are our first name dot last name at sdstate.edu. It is located in the guidebook. Uh, and we appreciate you joining us. And, and I apologize sincerely for the technical difficulties we experienced tonight. Um, but thank you for sticking it out with us and, and asking great questions. Again, we are so excited for this program and look forward to a great summer leading into our first ever mock session. Um, I see we did have
So mm -hmm. Kendall had a question about members being able to vote. So anyone 4-H age 8 to 18 as of January 1st can both sign, sign the petition and vote. Yep. Great clarification. And just to reiterate, um, again, this is uh, obviously our first year and we we really see the need in this. Um, and But with that, we know that it's not perfect yet. And so we know this will take several years to get it there. And unfortunately, we're trying to roll the, the program out in um, a COVID-19 year, which adds some level of difficulty. Um, but certainly if you have ideas or thoughts or, or um, you know, just, any, anything that you think might help us through the process, we, we really are an open book and we want to look to make the program better and um, we will take every suggestion and um, see what we can do with that. So please feel free to reach out to us in any sort of capacity that way. Um, you can shoot us an email with any suggestions or thoughts and we'll look to discuss that as a, a program committee. So again, thank you so much, and we look forward to hopefully having you join us uh, next week for our next webinar.